with it. So here's the thing. We've started a series that we're calling Breaking Bread with Jesus, where we're looking at uh, really through the Gospel of Luke and his telling of different times when Jesus had dinner with people. And, and so when we started this, I started to think about the best meals that we've ever had. And we've asked some people online, but I want to tell you about one of mine. I've had quite a few, and people should, you know, they usually talk about meals because they're sentimental and all of that stuff. And I've got some of those, like Thanksgiving with my kids and that sort of stuff. But I want to tell you about one in particular. I traveled down to Dallas, Texas with a coworker to spend three days learning more about worship and technology and those sorts of things. And anytime I travel, and even just here at home, I tend to eat places that are more local and not chain restaurants, unless, of course, that chain restaurant isn't available here in the Joplin, Carl Junction area. And so uh, we got there, we were right downtown in Dallas, so we were walking around, and we found this little bar and grill called the Press Box Grill, and we went and we had dinner, and it was nice. And the next day we went to uh, a Mexican restaurant, which was good, and then I can't remember the other one, but the very last night, we were tired, and so we just walked back to the Press Box Grill to have dinner again. And that night, I ordered uh, this jalapeno honey-glazed pork chop. And I like pork chops, but, you know, it's not like it, I ever really think to myself, hey, what do I want for dinner? Oh, I want a pork chop. You know, I never really think that, but, but it's good. But on this particular night, I ate this pork chop, and as I did, I wept. Literally, I wept. I, I had tears in my eyes because... Um, it was, as, and I'll just quote what happened in that moment, and I, I looked at Landry, who was with me, and I said, this is the best damn pork chop I've ever had, and I wept, not because it was good, but because we were there two nights earlier, and I didn't have it, and I could have been having it for three nights. Press box grill. Oh my gosh, it changed my life around pork chops. But then at the same time, it ruined it because I go other places and they advertise pork chops with some glaze, and it was not as good. So, at any rate, that's one of my best meals. Uh, there's uh, been a few others of people who have shared stories of their best meals. I want to read a couple to you. A church member by the name of Chris Briley wrote this. He says, My most memorable meal was at a place in Gulf Shores with my dad a couple years ago. He was given eight months to live due to a brain tumor. So he said there were some things he wanted to do before then. One of them was to go shrimping and deep sea fishing, so he took them. He says, after we finished dinner and the server asked if we wanted dessert, key lime pie or bread pudding, my dad says this, oh, well, I like both. Hmm, I'll take, and then Chris writes, he says, and I cut him off and I said, we will take both. And I lost him a few months later. That was one of the most memorable meals that he had. Kayla Horn, who works with us on staff, she does college ministries for the church. Uh, she wrote this. She said her most memorable meal was a crawfish boil down south, probably my first one. Anybody done a, a true southern crawfish boil? Oh, my gosh. Mm -mm -mm. That's one of the reasons why I love Louisiana so much. It's the food. Uh, it says this, a crawfish boil. I had never seen people dump piles of boiling hot seafood onto the middle of a table, usually covered with paper. And it says, everyone came around the table, they prayed, and they dug in. The laughter, the sense of community, and the pounds of seafood piled in front of us made for a pretty memorable moment. Yeah. Other people talked about, uh, you know, cooking with their parents and, and meals with their kids and dad's uh, grilling hamburgers or Saturday pancakes and mom's chicken enchiladas and grandma's potato salad. You know, there's something about a meal often that just kind of, you know, memories are made, right? Now, anybody hungry yet? <laughs> I am. Um, and so I mean, we're in the second episode. This is just the second week of talking about food. And so you're going to have to you know, be prepared for the next few weeks. But, but we're talking about this because in the Gospel of Luke, when you focus on things around Jesus and the times that he ate people, you'll notice interesting stuff because every time Jesus eats with people, interesting things happen. In fact, so much of Jesus' ministry and his teaching, they happened around meals. And so that's where we're going to focus on this. And just so you know, don't take my word for everything. Get into your Bible yourself. We, we provide a study guide that you can download online to kind of get you deeper 
in, into these stories by yourself or with other people. So please do that. Take some notes as we go through this. Um, but that's where we're going to be heading. I, I've always loved these stories around Jesus at the table with different people. And today, we're going to look at one of the most famous times Jesus had a meal with people. And you've probably at least heard of this in some way. It, it's about the time he had dinner with 5,000 people or possibly more. Um, it, it said that uh, 5,000 people showed up, 5,000 men, uh, but we believe it's more than that because women and children most likely were around. And unfortunately, back then, uh, women and children were very overlooked and marginalized and weren't written about very much. So 5,000 plus people. And in this particular story, is actually one of the few stories that actually appears in all four of your Gospels, which lets us know that this particular event was important. But why is it so important? What does it mean for us today? That's what we're going to get to. Now, here's the thing. If you've been here for a while, you might recognize that in the month of March, we looked at this same story, but we looked at it from John's perspective. And in John's gospel, he always writes about these miracles of Jesus as something that happens as a sign to point towards a characteristic of God. That's what John wanted to do. But Luke gives us a different angle on this story. And he and this view that teaches us in some different ways and challenges us in some different ways than the way John did. And what I want to do is I want to read this story in its entirety and maybe have you just take a moment, let it out, and, and think about the scene where you're at. I'm up on a hillside, um, not a lot of trees around, middle of the day. It says this, When the apostles returned, they told Jesus everything they had done, then they slipped quietly away from the town of Bethsaida, but the crowd found out where he was going, and they followed Jesus. He welcomed them, and he taught them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who were sick. Late in the afternoon, the twelve disciples came to Jesus and said, Send the crowds away to the nearby village and farms so that they can have food and lodging for the night. There's nothing to eat in this remote place. But Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Or, or are they expecting us to go and buy enough food for the whole crowd? For there were more than 5,000 men there. Jesus replied, tell them to sit down in about groups of 50 each. So the people all sat down. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. He looked towards heaven. He blessed it. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread and the fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. So that's how Luke tells this story. And give you just even a little more background, you need to realize that Jesus had decided prior to this event that he and his disciples, they needed to get away from the crowds. Uh, they, they needed to, to get some time away to be alone for their teaching because up at this point, they're constantly on this teaching tour and a healing tour, and they are exhausted. They are tired. Jesus also, right around here, just gotten word that his cousin, John the Baptist, you may know that name, John the Baptist was killed. He was beheaded. And according to Mark's gospel, prior to this, this is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. You ever get yourself so busy that you forget to eat lunch? Yeah. So they're tired. They're worn out. They're exhausted. They need a break. They're human. So they get in a boat and they sail across the Sea of Galilee. And, and, but here's the problem when you do that. And I've been to the Sea of Galilee and it is a, a huge, we would call it a huge lake, um, and it sits in the bottom, and on every side it comes up. And again, there's not a lot of trees, so you can always see the Sea of Galilee, and you can see people in a little boat. And what did the people do when they saw Jesus and the disciples in the boat going somewhere? They decided to go there as well. They went to see Jesus. They went to hear Jesus. They wanted to be healed by Jesus. So when Jesus arrived to take a break, so did thousands of people. When they get to Bethsaida, it says about 5,000 were there, like I mentioned. Um, but it might have been as many as ten or 15,000. Uh, what, 
what do you think the disciples are feeling at this moment? Huh? What would you be feeling? Excited? Happy? I'm guessing they're not. Uh, I bet they're a lot like me. When I get tired and exhausted and a little bit hungry or hangry, as we call it, I'm a little bristly. I'm a little grumpy. I imagine they're frustrated and they're like, really, seriously? You can't just leave us alone for a little bit to be by ourselves? But when this happened, Jesus responds so beautifully to the people. He says this. He says he welcomed them. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and he healed those who were sick. Now, notice this. In the midst of trying to get away, to take a break, Jesus is always paying attention to what's going around him. So many of the most important things happened in Jesus' ministry, by the way, whenever he was interrupted with something, and while he was planning on doing something else. And I think the same is true in our lives today. We need to be interruptible. And I have to admit, it is difficult for me to be interruptible because I am a planner, I am a type A person, and I've got my days planned out, right? And the interruptions are usually the things that make you go, ugh, is it just me? I, I can't see you guys. Whew. We need to be interruptible. I have learned over the last 15 years of ministry that some of the most important things that I ever do are in the times when I'm interrupted by somebody else, when I'm in the middle of something else. So that's one thing uh, that we can learn from this, is to pay attention to the interruptions, be interruptible. Those might be difference-making moments for you. And that's one important takeaway. I mean, that could just be a whole message on its own right there, but I want us to focus on, on some other things here. I want to focus on, on when his disciples came to Jesus, and they told him this. They said, Send the crowd away so that we can go to the nearby villages and countryside and find lodging and food because this is a deserted place. That's where they started. Send them away. Jesus sent them away. This is deserted. Let them go somewhere where they can find a hotel, they can find a McDonald's, and they can take it easy. I imagine that by now it's later in the day and the disciples have been just dying to say this for hours. As kids, we know this because we're with our parents somewhere, like at church, and it's at the end of church, and we're dying to go eat somewhere, and yet dad or mom just sits and talks, right? And so they're just antsy, and they're waiting to say, Jesus, please just send them away. We need little times to ourselves. Can we at least have dinner together? Maybe, though, they're also concerned about the people as well. Maybe... They, they worry about their, what's going to happen to them around food in the evening, or maybe they're just tired. But they do this, and then Jesus responds this way. You give them something to eat. Did you catch that? I mean, that, I think, is the true point of the message today. Jesus said to the disciples, you give them something to eat, which Philip steps up and he says this he says lord we can't give them something to eat because it would take six months worth of worth of wages uh, for us to even earn enough to be able to pay for the food to feed these people and then jesus looks at all of them and he says okay well then just bring me what you've got whatever it is you can find which seems like an impossible task at the moment he says that, though, just bring me what you have. And so they brought him what they found, which was basically a lunchbox from a little kid, the five loaves of bread and two fishes. They bring this to Jesus, and he's like, all right, this will do. Here's what we've got. Now, let's, let's do this. And I, I bet the disciples at this point were thinking to themselves, what is going on? I mean, this is a lunchbox, Jesus. Can't you see the reality of our situation because we understand the reality of this situation. Jesus, just send these people away. But Jesus is like, no, I'm not going to do that. He, he takes the bread. He takes the fish. He lifts it up. He blesses it. He thanks God for it. And then he starts to break it into little pieces and putting it in baskets so that people can... It could be passed out. Now, it's difficult to get our minds around how this actually took place, this miracle. I mean, did the, the baskets miraculously just start to fill up with more and more bread? I mean, was, when he pulled off a piece, did it magically just show back up? Those sorts of things, we don't know. 
um, and the fish. Uh, what happened there? We don't know that. But that's the way the Gospels read, is that that's what happened. It could have been also, I've heard other people try to explain this in more logical terms, where they say, well, maybe it was the disciples giving away what they had that inspired everybody else who packed a lunch to start to share with everybody around them. But that's not how it reads. All we know is that something incredible happened. These fish and these loaves were multiplied to the point where there are 12 full baskets left. And it happened because somebody was willing to give away all that they had. And this is a beautiful story about taking the loaves and fish that you have, what, what little, what lunchbox size thing that you have, and surrendering it to Jesus in order to feed somebody else to help somebody else with their needs, and and how God can do incredible things and multiply what little bit you offer. And and somehow, every time that happens, everybody, like in the story, everybody is satisfied in the end, even the one giving the lunchbox. I mean, in this story, by the way, there is a very literal point that can be made. It not can be made, is made. Jesus cares about hungry people. And Jesus wants us to feed hungry people. Jesus doesn't want us to make sure that some other group or a government agency does it. That is one way we can help. But Jesus actually wants us to physically feed hungry people. And this is one of the reasons, as a church, you'll hear a couple times a year, um, like around Thanksgiving or around the Super Bowl, where we have people bring in food to stock local food pantries. This last Super Bowl season... Uh, Even in the middle of the pandemic and not a lot of people coming out, we still brought in over 900 pounds of food that went to to Cross Lines and Joplin and Helping Hands here in Carl Junction. Thanksgiving and Christmas, you do the same thing. Uh, because Why? Because we want to literally feed hungry people. We also have a, a personal ministry in the church that we call Soul Food. We like coming up with cute little names for things, but Soul Food, it's really cool. We have a number of people in the church that prepare meals that uh, each week go to a family that's going through a difficult time. Maybe they've lost a loved one, or they've had an illness, or they've lost a job, or an injury, or or maybe somebody's just on somebody's heart, and and they did that. I remember not too long ago, I was sick for a week, and I was stuck at home, and somebody brought me, man, this like chicken pot pie. Man, that could have been one of those meals. Oh my gosh. Man, that was so wonderful. Chicken pot pie. And every time one of those meals is delivered, i got to tell you, it brings a little bit of hope and some comfort and some joy. And that's been going on for quite a while here at the church with lots of families, especially over this last year, year and a half, where the pandemic and people have stepped up to serve in so many ways. We've got a couple of men's group that serve at Water Gardens, and what they do is they go down there and they serve a meal on the first Thursday of the month. They... They go themselves to buy the food. They, they don't like, hey, church, can you pay for it? No, no, no. They go and they take out of their own wallet. They go buy their own food. They go down there. They serve a meal for everybody who's there. They spend some time with the residents of Water Gardens, and, and they interact with people. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. So are you paying attention? Are you willing to share what you have to bless somebody else? And be blessed in the process. Let me tell you how it works. You look and see what you've got. It's very simple. And you give some of it away. You take what you have, you give it away. You share with people in need. And what you find out is when you do that, you become a recipient of something. Somehow there is this spiritual exchange of a blessing that happens when you meet the needs for other people. One of the things I'm really proud of as a church over the, especially the pandemic, is uh, something called Farmers to Families Program. And you may have heard us talk about that from time to time. Here's the reality is food insecurity actually happens in our little corner of Missouri. Um, It's a big deal. I know in the city of Joplin, 53% of the kids are on free or reduced lunches. I know Carl Junction is a lot less than that just because of the financial demographics. Webb City is a little less than 53%. Um, the Osho is a little bit more. But anyway, any rate, because of that, when the pandemic hit, food insecurity for many became actually a food crisis. For, for some kids in particular, um, that meal at school might be the only hot meal 
or good meal they have on any given day. And so we partnered with this group called Farmers to Families to get boxes of fresh produce and meats and those sorts of things out to 250 families a month. And we've been doing that. You've been doing that. Uh, they've also partnered with a group that does the same thing for senior citizens who, for many senior citizens, for months and months, they were actually quarantined at their house. They couldn't physically get out, so we would take things there. And, and one of our key volunteers in this is a friend of mine. His name is Brad DeGraff, and we interviewed him about all of this and why he does it. And I want you to hear from him as to why he serves people literal food. Watch this. Uh, my name is Brad DeGraff. I work uh, for a... Uh Ramp for Ramco Insulation, we do uh, industrial pipe and tank insulation. Well, it started out uh, where someone had reached out to my men's group. I'm in a men's group on Thursday mornings at, at 6 in the morning. And uh, somebody, somebody said, hey, uh, we need some help cooking for the folks at uh, uh, Mercy Village. Mercy Village is a local uh, senior, senior home. They were on lockdown. They'd been locked down for, I think, three or four weeks at the time, by the time we finally got the call. And uh, we, start, we started out cooking for, we did 80 meals every Sunday morning. Uh, for 11 Sundays in a row. Uh, fast forward a couple weeks after that, uh, Farmers to Family started up. Uh, Nancy and Fred reached out to me. Uh, they said that they needed some help uh, loading cars. Uh, Farmers to Families is a uh, food drive that is put on by, uh, I, I believe, the O'Reilly folks out of Springfield. And they uh, send down an, an entire semi-truck, 54 foot long, full of uh, food. There'll be milk products, eggs, there'll be vegetables, dairy, uh, dry goods. If you're in need, or even if you just know someone that's in need, um, you know, s sign up on the website, sign up on sp.church, and then come and pick up, pick up a box. And, and our goal is to get the boxes in the hands of people uh, that need them. You know, it's, it's tough to see people, uh, you know, that need, that need help, you know. And so uh, when I see it, it reflects on times when, when you know I needed it, you know, or times where there's been times in my life where, and so and so so to be able to offer that help now instead of asking for it, I think is, uh, it's, you know, it's, to me it's full circle. To me it's full circle. Yeah, it's a blessing that I'm able to do that now. If you're if you're listening, the look the Lord will will lead you where you can help. If you'll if you'll just pay attention the answer to where you're best used is right in front of you. If you can internalize that, then you can do a lot of, a lot of good, a lot of good. I don't think there's any doubt. I don't think there's any doubt, he says. If you're listening, if you're able to be interrupted, the Lord will use you in just what little bit that you have. I mean, here's the thing. You've got to know this. Brad is a working dad, he's a husband, three little kids, and yet somehow he makes time to feed hungry people. In the Gospel of Matthew, there's a story that Jesus tells. It's a story, you may have heard it called, it's the story of the sheep and the goats, where he's describing the sorts of people who inherit God's kingdom and the sorts that don't. And he told them this, the sheep, he says, you are the ones that when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And then the people asked him, Jesus, when did we ever feed you? And Jesus replied this way, every time you fed someone in need, you fed me. Literal feeding. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. Now, yes, yeah, sometimes we're supposed to literally feed hungry people, but sometimes, and you know this, you're, you're smart enough to know that it's not just about literal food. Sometimes it's about providing love and caring and compassion or counseling or a job or even a home or friendship to somebody. Last week, we talked with Cody and Nicole Bandy. And they're a young couple in our church, and I want to tell you, a little bit about them. They have their permission to tell you some of this. Um, they have been coming to the church for a while, and they had this nudge that they needed to do something and to help. And so they prayed, God, help us to see what we're supposed to do. And, and in 2015, at this time, Nicole was a, a school teacher down in Goodman, 
and Cody was a lineman for Empire, and they had good jobs, and they had a nice home, and they, uh, they were what we call what? Dinks, dual income, no children, living the good life down there. And they started to pray, God, show us how we can make a difference. And they didn't know what God would, how they would answer that prayer. But eventually, Nicole found out that she had a boy in her class who's eight years old, and it came to her attention that his home life was falling apart, and he needed a place to stay. He was going to be put in foster care. And she talked with Cody, and they felt God's nudge to open up their home to him. And they could become foster parents really quickly because of Nicole being his teacher. There was considered a, a, a certain degree of kinship, a connection there. Uh, they, but they didn't know, though, whenever they took this boy in, is that this boy actually had two other teenage sisters that also needed a home. And so they went from zero kids instantly to three with two teenage girls all in one day. And all three kids were eventually placed in a permanent home six months later. Cody and Nicole, they decided to get fully licensed as foster parents. And the next placement they had in the June of the next year were two siblings aged six and eight. The kids had been spit up, uh, spit up, nah, split up. Uh, because of behavioral issues, but Nicole prayed that somebody would come along and would keep them together, and they would eventually be adopted by another foster parent. They knew that they wanted to help other foster kids in a better way, and, and so what happened is Nicole felt called and decided to quit her job at teaching right after they got the call to foster a newborn, a baby. They found out that the newborn had, <laughs> again, other kids alongside, siblings, ages two, three, and five, and they were already in foster care. They worked to keep all the kids together. Those kids joined their family. The baby, though, would eventually be um, reunited with its father because there was a different father in the mix. So there was a reunitement there, but the bandies then felt called and eventually adopted the three others. After they got the call, uh, after that, they got a call about another teenager who needed a placement. They took her in and are now the permanent guardians for her. And, and if you've lost count, because I have, I had to make notes so I could remember this. Uh, if you lost count, that is four kids permanently now as part of their family. And then um, Nicole and Cody became pregnant. They went from zero kids to five kids. In five years, Sadie is 15, Anna is 9, Zachary is 7, Justin is 5, and Dawson just is about to turn 1 this week. Dawson, by the way, their whole family, uh, they, they came and baptized Dawson last week. I mean, this is not a story about sharing literal food. This is a story about sharing whatever it is you have. That's what Jesus calls us to do, is to share whatever we have. For Cody and Nicole, it was their home, it was their time, it was their hearts, and God took care of the rest. And they would tell you, that because they said, we could not imagine life any other way now. Jesus is telling us, you give somebody something to eat. And listen, no, maybe you can't feed 5,000 people. But you can offer whatever it is you have to somebody. A good friend of mine in the church, his name is Mark Struey, great man, um, said this once, um, you see that one person, help that person. <laughs> Another pastor I've heard say it this way, do for one what you wish you could do for many. Jesus says you, feed them. So let me end this way. A few questions. Are you paying attention? Are you paying attention to who God puts in your path? Are, are you paying attention not to just them physically, but their needs? Are you willing to hold on to things lightly and, and offer them to people? Are you willing to give them your most precious time or part of your home, your finances, your skills? See, at the end of Luke's story, it says that everybody who was there, even the little boy who gave of his lunchbox, was satisfied. And then they had 12 baskets of food left over, one for each apostle. They 
reluctantly gave up what little bit they had. And yet, for some miraculous reason, in the end, they had enough. And they were satisfied. And that's how it works. We give. Not because we're looking for a blessing, but it happens. People continue to give what they have because what they find is they are filled up in the process. So that's just one more meal story that uh, helps us understand more about the heart of Jesus, the kingdom of God. And I just tell you, pay attention. Be ready to give. And don't worry if it feels in the moment like, I don't know if I have enough. Do for one what you wish you could do for many and let God take care of the rest. And for today, that is the good news of the story in Luke about some fish and some bread and a little boy willing to give it up. Let's pray. God, I just simply ask that you somehow speak to us through this teaching, that uh, somehow your spirit takes this little bit and multiplies it. God, I pray that you help us to overcome our fear of giving things away, that we don't live in a world of scarcity where where we want to hoard everything we have because what might happen in the future, God, that you somehow inspire us to be courageous with what we have and to be willing to give it away and trust you that you're going to give it back. God, for some hearing this today, we are the hungry and the scared and the worn out who are just desperately needing something. And God, I ask that you, you put those people in our paths who are willing to be interrupted that might be the difference between life or death for us. So come Holy Spirit, make us leave this place or leave this time somehow different because we spent it with you. Help us be more and more like the men and women you want us to be. Nothing more, nothing less. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.